a therapeutic ultrasound. This will be the basic science, I guess you could say, behind it. So with ultrasound, we'll understand some of the parts of the generator, the machine, terminology, thermal and non-thermal ultrasound, physiological mechanisms. So what is ultrasound? Well, it's not like the ultrasound you go, you know, if you're pregnant, you go to the doctor, you get an ultrasound of the fetus. That's not what this is. This is a therapeutic ultrasound, right? So there's a deep, it's a deep penetrating agent that produces changes in tissue through thermal and mechanical mechanisms. There's one megahertz and three megahertz. And we'll talk about those differences here in a second. Many uses, so heat, they can deliver medication. We call that phonophoresis, not iontophoresis. Iontophoresis is using electricity. Phonophoresis is using ultrasound and fracture healing actually as well. So the ultrasound production is produced by an alternating current flowing through a piezo electrical crystal housed in a transducer. Piezo electrical crystal produces positive and negative charges that contract or expand or contract or expand. So when the AC current passes through the crystal, it expands and contracts. It goes it literally changes shape. This produces the electropiezo effect or reverse piezoelectrical effect and sound waves. And this is what actually produces the wave that gets introduced to the body. Now with this chapter, you'll notice I have a lot of notes here at the bottom. So like this one, AC is the uninterrupted flow of electrons marked by a charge in the direction uh, magnitude of movement and the transducer is the device that converts one form of energy from the wall, right, electrical energy, to sound energy. So be sure you pay attention to that in the non-video uh, lecture. This is an ultrasound. We have the um, coaxial cable going down the wand, right? Right here, the coaxial cable actually is connected to the generator of the machine. And within this, we have the piezoelectrical crystal that changes into forms to producing the sound wave. And this transducer face is actually what get, gets rubbed on the patient's skin with the transducer medium. All right. Okay, terms to understand here. I thought I had something. E R A transducer face and piezoelectrical crystal, right? Co so this whole thing is considered the transducer face. Now within the transducer face, you have, and this is supposed to be a good circle here, but this whiter line right here, this whiter circle that I'm trying to draw within, is really the outline of the piezoelectrical crystal. So it doesn't take up the whole transducer face you have different sizes of ultrasound heads, right? So the ERA is the effective radiating area, and the ERA is always smaller than the transducer face. This picture is just showing you the alternating current coming into the coaxial cable and uh, leaving the coaxial cable and contracting and expanding the... Uh, Wow, crystal. So US is a, you know, a common abbreviation you'll see for ultrasound. So ultrasound produces a sinusoidal waveform. Waveform, frequency, amplitude, and velocity, blah, 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 right? So waveform is the, or wavelength, is the distance between the start of one wave and the end of one wave. So it's a cycle. Frequency is the number of times a wave passes per second. Amplitude is the distance from baseline to peak of the wave. So some of these, especially frequency, can get important here. So you can see the wavelength is 2 meters and it's 1 hertz. So if this was 1 second, it's completed 1 wave, if you will. And 1 second for this bottom photo, this has completed 2 waves. So technically that's 2 hertz. This becomes important when we talk about 1 megahertz versus 3 megahertz and heat that's going on within the tissues. Acoustical energy is transferred from, uh, by one molecule colliding with another. 
So when that molecule collides with another, it creates heat, right? So a leaf floating in a pond. Pebble drops near a leaf. That leaf bobs up and down as the ripple moves past, right? But the leaf does not actually change its position. It bobs up and down in the water, but it's not changing the position. And that's similar to what the molecule is doing when colliding with another due to this acoustical energy. The acoustical wave or ultrasound wave is not able to pass through air. It requires some type of coupling medium, whatever that coupling medium may be. Typically, we use ultrasound gel, right? You can use other mediums as well, though. Okay, longitudinal waves. Displacement occurs parallel to the direction of ultrasound. Okay, let's draw. This is the, the body. This little guy is going to be uh, our ultrasound, right? And this generator plugged in here. Great photo, Ryan. Yeah, I can draw. So as we're rubbing the ultrasound head on the patient, right, those molecules, the waveform is going straight into the body. So alteration of high and low pressure exerted by the beams results in either compression or rarefraction along the wave. Those two terms can be important. So let's take a second here and let's go, let's go here. We have, I have up here um, online on Blackboard, the handouts you should look at, these ultrasound definitions, these things. This is a great handout. You, it's so helpful, I think, because as the parameter and then the description, right? And then the three different laws of ultrasound that we'll talk about, the cosine, inverse squared, and law of Grothus Traper, which we already talked about a little bit with heat, right? So this picture is just showing you the crest of the wave, the trough of the wave, right? The amplitude, the height from baseline, and then the wavelength. This picture is actually showing you these pressure fluctuations that transmit energy within the tissues, and they can produce the physiological effects. So we have compression, right, and refraction. What happens in, oh, let's start with refraction, in refraction, the space between the molecules is increased, so we're not actually producing as much heat. The trough of the wave, as you can see here, results in rarefraction. Compression occurs closer to the crest of the wave. So if we have a wave that looks like this, whoa, let me start over. If we have a wave, I need to learn how to draw with this pen. We have a wave that looks like this. Yes, those are supposed to be very close together. What do you think is happening? Not a lot of compression and not a lot of refraction. There's, there's not a lot of space between the molecules at all, no matter what, because there's not a lot of wavelength, right? So you have refraction that usually occurs almost always during the trough, and you have compression that almost always occurs during the crest. Transverse or shear waves, these molecules in transverse waves are displaced perpendicular to the direction of energy. Right? So when longitudinal waves strike bone, they become transverse waves and they can't pass through fluid. So we're going to say this is a bone. Awesome picture, right? Ultrasound, generator, all that stuff is over here. Bam. The waves are coming down. They're striking the bone. But what happens when the ultrasound wave actually strikes the bone, the bone's reflecting, right, in odd directions. Bam. So what can actually happen, say, in areas like your hand? There's not a lot of tissue here. There's some skin and bone. That's about it right here, right? You have your metacarpals. So what can happen is if we have the intensity or the megahertz too high or differently, right, we can actually cause a burn to the bone. Think of it as a microwave. We're cooking the bone from the first and then the superficial tissues, right? So the wave's hitting the bone. It's getting shot off in all these different directions. And some of the wave will come back and hit off the ultrasound head 
and back down and back up and back down. When that happens, that creates a hot spot. That is how you actually burn somebody using a thermal ultrasound. That's a lawsuit. Don't do it. We don't want that, right? Higher the frequency of the wave, the less the sound beam diverges, like the movie Divergent, right? Or spreads. So we don't like divergence. Or sorry, we do like divert. We yeah, we want this. Don't listen to me. We want this. So the higher the frequency, the less the divergence occurs. Ultrasound produces very focused beams, and the ultrasound waves may diverge a little bit as they travel through a medium. Closer to the sound head, the sound field is non-uniform, forming high-intensity ridges and low-intensity valleys called near fields. This is the portion of ultrasound beam that is actually used for therapeutic purposes. So what happens here, uh, I have a picture actually, I won't draw, I won't draw. Rate of, of absorption. Absorption increases as the frequency increases, thus less energy is transmitted to deeper tissues. Hmm. I think that's a law of Gerthus Draper maybe a little bit, right? So tissues that are high in water content have a low rate of absorption. Huh. But tissues that have high protein content will have a higher rate of absorption. So muscle. Muscle has a lot of protein, right? So muscle will have a higher rate of absorption than fat. Ultrasound is really good for muscle. Attenuation is the decrease in energy intensity as the wave is transmitted through various tissues. So what's happening here is you produce, so you rub an ultrasound unit, all right, ultrasound head on a patient, it's going into the body. As it hits the body, what is happening is absorption is, is occurring a little bit, right? Absorption, especially in, uh, tissues high in protein, but also attenuation, the decrease in the energy intensity as the wave is transmitted through various tissues. So say you're using my elbow here, my, my uh, wrist extensors out here, right? So I have skin, I have fascia below the skin, and then I have muscle, and then bone. So maybe I want to get to my deepest wrist extensor. Well, maybe by the time the sound wave actually reaches that deepest wrist extensor, Attenuation has actually happened. Only, say out of 100 sound waves, only three are reaching that muscle belly. Why? Attenuation is occurring. It's very similar to the law of Grothus Draper. So let me exit this. Let me go to these laws, right? The inverse square law. Intensity, intensity of radiant energy depends on the distance between the source, tissues described by the inverse square law, blah, blah, blah. E is the amount of energy received. ES is the amount of energy produced by the energy produced by the source, and then D squared produce us the square distance of the target tissues. So pretty much, if we have a larger proportional area, what's going to happen to the amount of energy? Cosine laws: electromagnetic energies must effectively transmitted to the tissues when right angle, 90 degrees, angle of incidence. So what happens if I'm producing or using an ultrasound on my arm right here, I want to keep the ultrasound unit flush on my skin, 90 degree angle, right? It's flat. If I raise the ultrasound up a little bit, only these beams that were in contact with my forearm are getting into the body. The waves up here where my knuckles are, are going towards my computer and the table now. So they're not actually hitting the skin. So the ultrasound is actually becoming less effective, right? And the law of growth is Draper. I think we know this law by now. I hope we know this law by now. Okay. Rate of absorption. Soft tissue and air. Huh. Percent reflected. 99.9% .9 of the sound wave will be reflected with that. Water and soft tissue, about 0.2. Fat, soft tissue, 1. Um, and then you can see soft tissue bone. I'm not that worried about that, right? This piezoelectrical effect, alternate current is generated at the same frequency as passed through the crystal. It contracts, expands. Direct current mechanical deformation um, of the crystal generates a voltage. In reverse, right, piezoelectrical effect, AC current reverses polarity, causing that crystal to expand and contract, and that is actually what produces the ultrasound wave. 
the reverse piezoelectrical effect is actually more, uh, I guess, important than this direct piezoelectrical effect. Huh, this near field or Fresnel, Fresnel zone. Why in modalities, you'll see this actually a lot in, in medicine, they have four or five different names that describe the same thing. It, it has never made sense to me, but anywho. The near field or Fresnel zone. This is the pressure variations that occur because the transducer head acts as if it were formed by many smaller transducers, each producing its own sound wave. And remember, closer to the, sound, or to the transducer, so the ultrasound head, these areas are more individually ind uh, distinguishable. So you can actually see... Remember that near field and far field? So bam, this is the ultrasound wave. This is the crystal, right? Coaxial cable. This is the whole ultrasound head. As you can see, this near field, it's very collimated, right? It's a nice straight path down. Not much is diverging. Not everything is going in weird directions, right? In the far field, we have some other things that are occurring. You can see um, this near field, the portion of the ultrasound being as close to the sound head, and spatial peak intensity is in the far field. Well, what does that mean? Spatial peak intensity. We'll get there. But remember, a couple of slides ago, where was this now? Uh, yes, closer to the transducer head, the sound field is not uniform forming high-intensity ridges and low-intensity valleys. So this picture doesn't really show you the valleys and, and, and all that very well, right? The laws of ultrasound just did those. Ha. Huh. Okay. That is the easy stuff in ultrasound. This is where people, students, myself, certain days of the week, uh, start to get a little confused, right? So the ERA, yes, it's important in baseball, and it's still important in softball and ultrasound. So the ERA, effective radiating area. Ultrasound head is uh, the proportion of the transducer surface area that produces the ultrasonic energy. It's described in centimeters squared. It is always smaller than the actual size of the transducer's face. Most of this energy from the sound ultrasound is concentrated towards the center of what the head of the ultrasound unit. So we're going to make this the ultrasound unit. That's supposed to be an equal circle. The ERA might only be this, right? So this bad boy that I'm circular drawing in here is the important stuff. This stuff out here, eh. Still important. But the majority of that energy is going to be concentrated dead center in here. So large EL ERAs, I almost said ELA, <laughs> large ERAs produce a collimated focused beam, right? So if this is the ultrasound transducer, a larger ERA, let's say this whole portion is the ERA, it's going to focus a nice focused beam. Right? Bam. All these are nice focus beams. Maybe have a straggler here and there, right? Let me erase that. But now, with a smaller ERA, let's say this is the ultrasound head, and then this is the ERA. They have, yeah, they have some nice beams, but then they also have more divergent beams. What is going on here? So if we're treating a localized area, small area, lateral epicondylitis, my tennis elbow right out here on my wrist extensor, maybe I want more of a collimated beam. If I'm treating a larger area, maybe I want a more divergent beam. But we'll talk about treatment areas in a uh, little bit. So I added this photo last time I actually taught this class from my students here in, in Massachusetts because they were having a little more confusion which with uh, collimated and diverging beams. And this is just straight laser from a physics lab. More collimated beam, as you can see, is straight here. A divergent beam is more of a cone-like. And yes, you're going to have some, you know, 
stragglers or whatever the heck you want to call them coming out here. Um, but the divergent beam is more cone-like than a collimated beam straight down, right? So the ERA is actually used to calculate the spatial average intensity and the spatial average temporal average intensities. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> so before we go to that sheet with my definitions, which I, I, I literally have this sheet printed out next to me when I'm in class and we go over this sheet all the time. We're always reading these definitions. So please have that sheet with you, either on your screen, print it out, whatever it might be. The ERA is always on the back of machines or on the ultrasound uh, coaxial cable that connects into the machine. The reported and actual ERA will vary. So the, if the ERA, yeah, we're not worried about that yet. So what were the two terms I just said? Spatial average intensity and spatial average temporal average. So the SAI or spatial average intensity is the average intensity over the area of the transducer, a measure of energy density. It's measured in watts per centimeter squared, okay? And the SAI describes the amount of power per unit in the sound head's ERA. Hmm. You know what's actually kind of crazy is when we produce ultrasound or we write down our ultrasound notes, say I did ultrasound on my elbow, I might write down, yeah, I did 3 megahertz at 1.0 watts per centimeter squared. This is why watts per centimeter squared. It's the average intensity that I turn up the machine to over the area of the transducer. So to understand the temporal average, we need to go over the SATP, the spatial average temporal peak. So the spatial average intensity during the on time of a pulse and is displayed as intensity on the ultrasound output meter. However, this is only meaningful with pulsed ultrasound. What does that mean? We'll get there. And the spatial average temporal average, right, is the describes this definition above it as calculated across a duty cycle. What the heck's a duty cycle? But this is also only important during pulse ultrasound. So a duty cycle, the percentage of time the ultrasonic energy is being emitted from the sound head. A 100% duty cycle indicates the constant ultrasound output and produces primarily thermal effects within the body. And a low duty cycle produces non-thermal effects. So if I want thermal effects, say on my hamstring, I would do a 100% duty cycle. But what happens if I just sprained my ankle this morning and I want to use ultrasound on it, but I don't want to use thermal effect because heat, thermal effect when an acute injury, that's a no-no, right? So I could actually change the machine to 10% duty cycle or 25% duty cycle whatever the lowest is for that machine. Almost every machine has 25, 50, and 100% duty cycle. Every manufacturer varies a little bit. Some machines will actually have 10 and 30 and 75, and they cost a little more money because they have more options, if you will, but they're very similar. Okay, who's confused? Raise your hand. I'll stop raising my hand. So, these are different ultrasound heads that you can buy for a unit, right? So the ERAs are going to be different for all of these units. These are supposed to be great circles. All right. So the larger, the more collimated, the smaller, the more divergent, cone-like, right? Okay. Frequency, the ultrasound output frequency is measured by the megahertz and describes the number of waves produced in one second. We have one in three megahertz as the most common. Every now and then an older ultrasound machine will have a two megahertz option. Let's see this chart in three slides. So, sorry I'm drinking my water here. This is contrary to popular belief. One megahertz ultrasound actually goes deeper into tissues than three megahertz ultrasound. You will get confused. I hopefully won't confuse you after this. I hopefully won't say it the wrong way. Uh, but yes, it is contrary to popular belief. Three megahertz is for targeting more superficial tissues. One megahertz is more for deeper tissues, 
targeting deeper tissues. Depth of penetration in tissues is inversely related to the output frequency. Inversely related, so therefore, right, that makes sense. One megahertz is deeper than three megahertz. <clears throat> Ultrasonic energy creates molecular friction as it passes through tissues, losing energy to the tissues. So remember, friction represents a loss of energy, not attenuating energy that left to be transmitted to deeper tissues. So one megahertz penetrates about five centimeters and three megahertz anywhere from two and a half to three centimeters. So one megahertz ultrasound could be considered a deep heating modality. High frequency or three megahertz provides treatment to superficial tissues. Energy is rapidly absorbed and heats three times faster than one megahertz. This prevents unstable cavitation from occurring. So almost anywhere in this lecture that I have a word bulleted, like unstable cavitation, it should be back in your handout definitions or at the bottom of the notes. Oh, look, unstable cavitation, the violent oscillation and subsequent rupture of bubbles during ultrasound application at too high of an intensity. So we're actually producing tissue damage by having the ultrasound um, intensity too high. Don't mind my spelling errors in there, as you can see. So, three megahertz energy is more rapidly absorbed than, than uh, one megahertz, right? Heat produced by one megahertz ultrasound is longer lasting, though, than the heat produced by one megahertz ultrasound. And unstable cavitation, the violent oscillation and subsequent rupture of bubbles during the ultrasound application at too high of an intensity. Bam, one megahertz, three megahertz. I don't think I have anything yet on the bottom here. Know this chart, I love this chart. I used to put it on every test since I taught this class. Beam profile, depth of penetration, maximum rate of heating, and then heat latency. How long does it last for the heat, right? So one megahertz, relatively, Divergent, five centimeters or more, about 0.36 a degree Fahrenheit per minute per watt per centimeter squared. What? So if I set the machine to two watts per centimeter squared, which is actually pretty high, it's going to produce some heat. It's going to actually produce a lot of heat. The benefit with one megahertz ultrasound is it retains heat twice as long as three megahertz. Three megahertz, collimating, right, goes off in different forms are more cone-like. Depth of penetration, about one to three centimeters, give or take a little bit. But it heats quicker, but it doesn't last as long with the heat. Here's my photo, All right? One megahertz, three megahertz, bam. Did I say that backwards, collimating, divergent? One megahertz is divergent, so it's going more uh, cone-like. Collimated is three megahertz. It's more in line. Yes, I did say that backwards. Sorry. See, I, I knew I was going to say something to screw you guys up. Three megahertz is more, what do we call that word? Collimating. One megahertz is more divergent, and you can see why at this photo here. It's more of a cone-like. But you can also see at this photo, one megahertz goes a lot deeper. It goes all the way to bone. Versus 3 megahertz might only go halfway through the muscle, but again, I don't know what this picture is trying to depict, what muscle this is, right? Power and intensity power is produced by ultrasound generator measured in watts. And intensity is described uh, the strength of sound waves at a given location within the tissues. Nothing important there, really. The spatial average intensity, or SAI, describes the amount of energy passing through the sound head's ERA. It's expressed in watts per centimeter squared. And the SAI is a measure of power per unit area calculated by the sound head, calculated by dividing power output by the ERA, by the transducer head. We don't need to do that math, but we could. So if 10 watts were being delivered through the transducer head with an ERA of five centimeters per uh, square, the SAI would be two watts per centimeter squared. So what could produce or cause a higher energy density 
to be produced than is indicated on the unit. Hint, it has to do with a law. We'll get there in a second. So standard treatment ranges, you know, dosages, so that's the intensity that we're turning up the machine before we turn, uh, before, uh, not before, actually during the treatment, the standard treatment doses range from 0.3 to 5 total watts. Now, if we watts per centimeter squared, that's going to be different. If radiating area of the sound head is smaller than the specified or sound head is not in full contact with the skin, uh, what law is this? So if I go back here and I look at my law, that's my cosine law, right? You could even probably say that's an inverse square law. You could probably get away with saying both these laws, probably not a law of Guthrie Straper, but uh, yeah. Henrik Stenson wins the British Open. Man. He was on fire today. Anywho, spatial average temporal peak intensity describes the average intensity during the on time of a pulse. So let's draw here. See if I could draw. This is baseline. Let's say this is the ultrasound at 25% versus ultrasound at 100%. Bam, 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 right? This is the on time of the pulse, on, on. So during SATP, the output meter on the ultrasound display is the only the on time of the pulse. So here and here, not down here. The SATA, the spatial average temporal average intensity, measures the power of ultrasonic energy delivered to the tissues over a given time. Again, this is only meaningful for pulsed ultrasound. If energy is delivered to tissues per unit of time at a 50% duty cycle, that is half of what a continuous mode is. Well, yeah, duh, 50% is half of 100. I think I know that, right? So if the SAI, special average intensity, of 2 watts per centimeter squared with a 50% duty cycle, the average would be... 1 watt per centimeter squared. Hmm. And this describes the total amount of energy that's being delivered to the body during the treatment. So terms, again, I put them in here. They're on your sheet. SAI is the amount of energy passing through the sound head DRA. SATP, average intensity during the on time of the ultrasound, pulse ultrasound. SATA measures the watt of power of ultrasonic energy in, uh, over time. Whew. take a five minute break your brains are probably hurting we're not even close to being halfway done I'm talking fast uh, we're close to being halfway done technically ultrasound beam non-uniformity BNR not a DNR but a BNR so the ultrasound output consists of peaks and valleys High and low energy shaped by minute imperfections of the crystal producing the wave. The BNR describes a variation between the peaks and the valleys, right? Peaks, spatial peak intensity, and the valleys. This is the ratio of the highest intensity within the beam to the average intensity reported on the output meter. And you can see the formula here, BNR equals SPI divided by SAI. What's important here is, this is a picture but what is important here is a high BNR ratio can actually cause tissue damage and burn you. Uh, yeah, so the arrow that's on the left of the beam is the peak intensity. Why does this have a BNR of 2 to 1? Well, look at this. This looks really nice. This is almost all uniform. But if I open this back up in a big picture here, you can tell that this is the peak of the wave. And there's not much distance in this valley here. So, uh, that's not a good picture. Let's draw. Let's start, let's start over. So, this is the beam, right? A bad BNR would be something like this. That would be a crazy BNR. This one's probably, you know, 10... So one, this is probably two to one ratio. This actually should be dots, but you know it's easier drawing the line. Why? How do I know that? 
the distance between the valleys and the peaks. So perfectly uniform beam will never happen. One to one ratio never happen. If a company's trying to sell you one of those, run. Don't let them take your money. If the BNR is at, indicated as three to one, the meter displays about two watts. If at some point the actual, uh, so let me back up, at some point, not if at, but at some point in the beam, the actual intensity is actually equivalent to six watts. So if we take that three, right, to one ratio, we take that three, multiply it by that two, since we know what the meter says, that's six watts. The presence of these high intensity areas in the beam create hot spots. And this is also why we use or move the ultrasound head. If we don't move the ultrasound head, we can create hot spots even further because that reflection, refraction, compression, right? All those terms tying together and you can actually cause somebody to get burned. And when I first got out of college, I was working at a physical therapy clinic back in Buffalo. I'm from Buffalo, right? That one of the physical therapists on staff actually burned a patient because he was doing ultrasound on her while talking to another patient and he didn't move the ultrasound unit, ultrasound head. He's standing there instead of ultrasounding, he's standing there like, uh, what? And he forgot to move it. The patient's trying to tell him that, hey, this hurts. He's not paying attention because he's talking to another patient. Not good. I think things, something unique for an athletic trainer, we are actually good at multitasking um, but still, that's no grounds. So you could still burn somebody. Don't burn somebody. That's a lawsuit. So beam non-uniformity ratio. So our ultrasound unit, actually, in my lab, athletic training education lab, at some point, all ultras our ultrasound unit, which is a 5 centimeter ERA, is producing a total power of at least 7.5 watts. If I turn up the intensity on the machine to this, 1.5, right, and I know the ERA of the machine I can figure out the total power. So a BNR greater than eight to one is unacceptable because the energy delivered to the body would be harmful. So the Federal uh, Food and Drug Administration, FDA, actually states that BNR must be on all units. And what is the BNR of our unit in the lab? Well, I think it's actually uh, six to one or five to one in my lab. But the higher the BNR, the less expensive that machine is, right? So if you purchase a machine that has a two or three to one BNR, that machine's going to cost more. It's going to be better for the patient too, remember, than a BNR machine with a BNR of six, seven, or eight to one, right? I'd say most machines are probably five to six uh, BNR to one, right? So the, this, this thing's called the half layer value. This is the depth of where 50%, okay, half layer value, of the ultrasonic energy is absorbed by the tissues. So if we apply ultrasonic at one watt per centimeter square, it loses 50% of its energy at a depth of 2.3 centimeters. The beam intensity is now only half a watt per centimeter square. At twice this depth, ultrasound is only 0.25 watts per centimeter squared. Why is this important to know? Well, what happens if I'm trying to heat my hamstrings, pretty deep. My glutes, my obtuators, gemelli, all right? These are all muscles, deep muscles in your glutes and your hip area that do some rotation stuff for your hip. Those are deep muscles. So if I'm trying to heat those, half layer value sh uh, tells me, shows me, that half of the uh, ultrasonic energy is going to be absorbed by the tissues, superficially. Huh, isn't that like the law of growth as Draper? Isn't that like attenuation? I will have on your test at the end of this upcoming week here, uh, at the end of this week actually, a question on comparing half layer value, attenuation, and law of growth as Draper. How are they similar? How are they different for a patient? Why else do you think that's important to know for a patient? Yeah, I didn't put that in there. Good. Half layer value, attenuation, the decrease in the wave's intensity resulting from absorption reflection, refraction of the energy. So if you don't remember what absorption, reflection, refraction are, say that three times fast, I put them in here. Absorption, your body absorbs the sound waves. Reflection, sound waves bounce back. Straw and water example. Looks like it's broken. I actually don't have any straws at the house. I'm actually recording at my house today. Um, so if you put a straw, do this at home if you have a straw. 
you put a straw in a glass so you can actually see the straw, it looks like the straws, instead of being nice uniform, it looks, it looks like the straw is cut in half. Why? That's refraction, right? Ooh, we're moving. Duty cycle, the net effects of each pulse, thermal and non-thermal, is based upon the duty cycle. Continuous ultrasound is also known as thermal ultrasound because it output creates primarily thermal effects. Anything less than 100% is considered non-thermal ultrasound. Pulsed, i.e. 25%, creates primarily non-thermal mechanical effects. This can be used, and I have used it in the acute inflammatory stage. Huh. Nope, no picture, or no description here. This picture is trying to depict um, a, a lot better than I drew. 100% uh, duty cycle, temperature, and 25% duty cycle. So think of it as a 100% duty cycle. It's always on. It's bam, 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 bam. Always on. As time goes on, right? Say you're doing ultrasound for seven minutes. Heat, this dotted line, is going to increase because it's always on. Vibration, oscillation are occurring, right? But with 25% duty cycle, it's not always on. It's on one out of every four cycles, let's say, right? So, bam, nothing, 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 bam, nothing, 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 bam. That's 25% duty cycle. So, it heats uh, minimally, I should say, not quickly, but minimally, when it hits that 25% duty cycle, and then it decreases, then it slightest increase then decrease slightest increase over time but is that enough to actually cause thermal changes not really now remember that's 25 percent duty cycle so if we're at 75 percent duty cycle it would look exactly like this but every third uh yeah every fourth one would be gone so this one would be gone this one would be gone right so it would produce heat more so than the 25 percent duty cycle right continuous output so you affect, if you want 100% duty cycle or continuous output, the heat tissue is located five or more centimeters deep, depending on frequency used. Energy is produced 100% of the time. Outputs measured in terms of the SATP intensity uh, must not exceed eight watts per centimeter squared because you could actually do some serious damage. With pulsed output, pulsing the ultrasound output decreases the temporal average intensity, reducing thermal effects, increasing the proportion of non-thermal effects. Um, duty cycle describes the percent of time that the ultrasound is being emitted from the transducer. All right, so 25% duty cycle, bam. One every right, four pulses. Ration between the pulse length. Eh. Output in pulse ultrasound is measured by the spatial average temporal average intensity. Actual amount of energy delivered to tissues dependent on the duty cycle. Closer the, to 100% we get, the greater the net thermal effects we have, right? And that showed you that in the last photo chart thingy. The lower duty cycles produce greater non-thermal effects, right? So, right, closer to 100, more heat. Less, uh, further away from 100, less heat. That's all this is trying to say in many words. Man, that's what a 50% duty cycle looks like. It's like every couple. Okay. Air transfer through tissues. Air is not dense enough to transmit ultrasonic energy. You need a coupling agent. Longitudinal waves can strike through soft tissue until they strike bone. Some of them are reflected back and then the rest are converted into transverse ray waves. This results in cell vibration. When the ultrasound beam strikes the acoustical interface, such as a different tissue layer, energy is either reflected or refracted. Musculoskeletal junctions are highly reflective, actually, though. So if we're using, like, a tendon -y, like your biceps tendon, like right here, ultrasound, that's actually good for it, right? There's actually a lot of bone right there, but yeah. This easily passes through adipose tissue as well. When a wave is reflected meets an incoming incident wave, this is called a standing wave. So the reflected wave meets an incoming wave. This forms a standing wave, not a timeout. And this actually increases the intensity of energy. This high level formation of energy is limited to a small amount of space. This doesn't happen as often, but again, this increases the risk of tissue damage. That's why we move the ultrasound head. That makes sense? 
So absorption of sound waves, transfer of energy to beam into tissues through converse and converse, conversion. Wow, I can't speak. Of mechanical into thermal energy. So now we're turning it from ultrasound, mechanical, into thermal energy. Now we're producing heat. Amount of absorption depends on the protein col uh, content of tissues and collagen. Tendon ligament tend to absorb ultrasound better than ultrasound. Why? Higher protein, right? The biophysical effects of ultrasound. Sounds pretty cool, but it's not. Non-thermal ultrasound. Changes within the tissues resulting from mechanical uh, effect of ultrasonic energy. The thermal effects changes within the tissues as a direct result of ultrasound elevation of the tissue temperature. All effects are treat, uh, limited to the treatment area, no more than two to three times the size of the sound heads ERA. That's not very big. The ERA is this big. We want no bigger than two to three times the size of that. So if I'm putting this on my forearm, bam, bam, bam. So maybe this area of ultrasound, that's it. Non-thermal effects when used with acute injuries are being treated or when heat is undesirable, right? So you can see with the pulse output, so technically you could do this two different ways. You could actually have it at 100% duty cycle but have the intensity at like 0.1 watts per centimeter squared, pretty low. Or the opposite, which is how I use it and almost everyone uses pulse ultrasound for non-thermal effects, is having the lower duty cycle and an output of at least 0.5 watts per centimeter squared. So remember, we talked about unstable cavitation, but let's talk about stable cavitation or cavitation in general. So cavitation occurs as a result of these pressure changes created by the ultrasonic wave that deforms microscopic tissues. These peaks and troughs, right, cause accumulating gas and formation of bubbles. These bubbles pulsate in ultrasonic fields, resulting in stable cavitation. We like stable cavitation, right? So when this happens, right, uh, where was I? Peaks and troughs that accumulate gas. So the peak, crest, trough that accumulates within the space. So really within this, the space of the amplitude, this creates air bubbles. So in stable cavitation, these things are just oscillating. In unstable cavitation, we actually have the intensity up too high, they're oscillating, and then they burst, they explode. Not what we want, right? Unstable cavitation, compression of these bubbles during high pressure peak, intensity is too high, followed by a total collapse during the trough. Uh, it explodes during the trough. So they explode, bam, right here, during refraction, when everything's spread out further. Acoustical streaming, ooh. The bulk flow of fluids in one direction. One direction's a great band. You know, Zane left the group and all, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, allows for increased cell membrane permeability that alters diffusion rate. So that's actually important. The bulk flow of fluids in one direction. Hmm. So if I have somebody that has an acute ankle sprain with all this swelling actually day, all that crap we don't want, right? We want to move it out one direction towards the lymphatic system, right? So if I do a non-thermal ultrasound, this thing called acoustical streaming actually helps the bulk flow of fluids in that one direction towards, hopefully, the lymphatic system. It changes cell permeability and can alter the diffusion rate. Very similar to what an ACE wrap can do. Remember a, co a compression wrap? Changes cell membrane permeability due to, uh, what's that law? Oh no, I lost the law. Well, hopefully you guys remember that law. Back in the chapter, first chapter or two we talked about. The compression law, it's not Boyle's law that has to do with yeah, thermodynamic stuff. Okay, moving on. Stable cavitation, microstreaming, and acoustical streaming all help with the early resolution of inflammation. Enhanced fibroblast recruitment. We want blasts, right? They build stuff. Fibers. They increase tensile strength and accelerate fracture healing. I would actually use this on a patient who just sprained their ankle. I would. Some people think I'm nuts because they don't understand the science behind ultrasound. I teach it, so therefore I understand. Therefore I can do, I think. Right? So I would have this patient, foot elevated, 25% uh, duty cycle, or as low of the duty cycle as I can on that machine. 
mm, probably anywhere from half a watt per centimeter squared to one watt per centimeter squared. Probably 10 to 12 minutes. Small area, probably right over the ATF, the anterior talofibular ligament, where they sprain, uh, most commonly the sprain ligament of the ankle is. Ooh, great chart again. I'm on a kick with these charts. Ultrasound waves, bam. Cell vibration, streaming, cavitation, awesome. Duty cycle, closer to non-thermal, closer to thermal, and things in between, right? Output frequency, what happens at one megahertz, three megahertz, deeper, superficial, right? Deeper, one megahertz, three megahertz is superficial. All the way down to here. So you, I'm not reading all these things. You can follow this. It improves tissue healing, decreases pain, and see thermal effects in the chapter six in this book. Well, that sucks. Oh, wait, that's the next chapter we're talking about. So hold your suspense till the next chapter. Thermal effects, the amount of temperature increase during treatment. TX, remember, treatment depends upon mode, intensity and frequency, vascularity, tissue type, Size of treatment area and ERA of sound head. We'll talk about primary thermal effects. Ultrasound is the same as the heat in chapter five. Well, it's not really chapter five, but it's you know something we talked about beginning of the semester, this summer. The thermal effects are exactly the same as heat, except it goes a little deeper, maybe. And it may last a little bit longer, three to five minutes. Crazy, right? So look at this, if I want vigorous heating, a three to four degrees Celsius change, I would need to do this for tissue elongation, the scar tissue reduction. A lot of people think oh, I'm gonna heat this hamstring and then I'm gonna stretch it because heat is a DPA modality, it's gonna help increase my stretch. Well, maybe not because if we don't increase this temperature to three to four degrees Celsius, we're not going to get tissue elongation. All right, so we've actually seen this chart with heat, moist heat, superficial heat. Now this is a chart very similar that looks at ultrasound. Next. Oh, man, muscle bellies are not as heat, well heated by ultrasound. Why? Well, there's protein, but muscular tendons junctions, remember tendons are really good, higher protein content at absorption, all right? Scar tissue and fascia, same thing. That's why scar tissue, high protein. This is a thermal imaging uh, image of a thermal ultrasound. Uh, hello from the Department of Redundancy of the Department of Redundancy Department of Redundancy. All right, it's like, what the hell is going on here? Amount of heat accumulation at one minute increases, blah, blah, blah. Bam. Not sure what body part this is in. All this is trying to show you is a thermal imaging camera like firefighters use to find people in a fire, find hot spots in a fire. It's also showing hot spots using less than one megahertz, two megahertz, and three megahertz ultrasound. With the three megahertz ultrasound over time, oh look, there's more heat than with a one megahertz ultrasound. Well, I think we could expect that. Cell response. So this acoustical streaming and cavitation to help increase cell membrane permeability because it changes the diffusion rate across cell membranes. This also increases histamine and intracellular calcium. This also helps mass cell degranulation and increased rate of protein synthesis. Thermal rate accelerates the rate of inflammation. Do we want inflammation? Yeah, at the beginning, all that stuff, but we don't want to necessarily purposely cause more inflammation, right? So does this make sense how some of that stuff we learned like three weeks ago now, right? I come back into play now, mm -hmm. but using this one specific therapeutic intervention, ultrasound, and one specific example of the cell response and what uh, the cell response is we're using thermal ultrasound. It's crazy how things can get tied in together. Made sure, yeah, yeah. So continuous ultrasound can increase local blood flow for up to 45 minutes post-treatment. Really, really. So by me rubbing the machine on the patient for seven to 10 minutes, that can increase my blood flow for 45 minutes. I don't know if I believe that one. Ken Knight, who wrote our textbook. Alteration of cell membrane permeability. Holy redundancy. Next. Nerve conduction and pain control. Well, it controls pain by affecting the peripheral nervous system. 
It influences the transmission of nerve impulses, right? Some membrane permeability and sodium ions that elevates the pain threshold, therefore can decrease their pain that they're perceiving, at least because it's elevating the threshold. Increase in the nerve conduction velocity, J. Uh, that's a typo. Ultrasound can also help decrease the pain spasm pain cycle, all right, by reducing the mechanical and chemical triggers in the PSP. Now, <coughs> PSP is like a gaming device, isn't it? PlayStation something personal? Personal PlayStation? I don't know. PSP and athletic training is the pain spasm pain cycle. Tissue elasticity, um, right, you have to at least 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit for tissue elongation to occur. After ultrasound, you only have a three to four minute window maybe to actually stretch that patient to deform the tissue, to cause plastic deformation, all these things, to actually see a tissue elongation change occur. To permanently elongate tissues, you have to heat, stretch, heat, stretch, heat, stretch. Stretching, joint mobilization must be done immediately after treatment ends. Is this the best way to elongate tissues? Probably not. I actually don't stretch many people anymore. We're going to talk about stretching, I think, next week. I use my hands. I use modal or not modalities, manual therapy. I teach, obviously, modalities, as you can see, but I use a lot of manual therapy skills. Muscle tendon healing. Uh, yeah. Wound healing. I've never used it for wound healing, but there's some research out there that you can use an occlusive dressing. Remember, an occlusive dressing is a dressing that nothing can permeate in, right? So you can actually use an occlusive dressing on a skin rash, like MRSA, like a staph infection, and make sure that that MRSA infection is contained. Fracture healing, lipus, low intensity pulse ultrasound. My Dr. Gullab, so my Dr. Gullab in lab, and, and I took this actually from my class I taught last semester, my, uh, one of my colleagues in the biology department, his wife had bilateral, so both forearm fractures two summers ago, fell uh, on her bike, flew over the handles and foosed, fell on outstretched hand, bam, fractured bilateral wrists. So her physician gave her this lipus unit, low intensity pulse ultrasound unit, to increase the rate of fracture healing. Bone growth stimulator, essentially. After Kelly, his wife, was done with it, He's like, oh, I have nothing to do. Like the insurance paid for it. So he actually just donated it to our lab and we I show students during class. <laughs> and phonophoresis is delivering using ultrasound to deliver medication through the skin. Um, I'll actually talk about that next class, next lecture. All right, not as simple as moving a wand. There's a lot of physiology, new terminology. Please remember to review the, the terms that I gave you on those handouts, the laws. Go back, reread this chapter if you have questions. And again, I think I've only had one or two of you, you guys email me or call me or text me if you've had any questions throughout the semester. Listen, I always have questions. Don't be afraid to ask. I'm not going to you know, jump out and yell at someone. I want to help. Remember, I'm the laid back one. I'm the Jimmy Buffett. At least I'm not in the beach anymore, right? I'm not in my uh, beach gear. <laughs> All right, so next lecture after this one is going to be on the clinical application of ultrasound. So how we set somebody up, the length of the treatment, how we rub the, the use the machine, rub the machine on the patient, all that fun stuff. I did this in under an hour. That is actually very impressive, by the way. <laughs>